what are some scoliosis treatments for adults? When we think of scoliosis, very often we think of kids with scoliosis. However, the largest population or largest percentage of the population that has scoliosis is actually older patients, adults. In fact, the percentage of population increases with age. So as basically, as we look at age groups, the older the age group becomes, the greater percentage of patients that actually have scoliosis. Because you have all the kids that are kind of becoming adults, and then you have all the adult onset cases that actually occur, and they accumulate over time, and therefore the, the, it expands as we get into the older age group. So we know scoliosis can affect all ages, um, including adults. But however, it's most prevalent or most diagnosed between 10 and 18 years of age. And this is something that we call adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. It's what we most commonly tend to think. However, again, like I said, it's not the most greatest percentage of patients in an age group. When we look at patients that are at 80 years of age, they are much greater percentage of patients of 80 that have scoliosis than at between 10 and 18. But we don't associate that as often because it's just what we learn about that scoliosis it affects kids. Now, there are different types of scoliosis. The most common type is idiopathic scoliosis, and idiopathic scoliosis has no clear associated singular causation factor. In fact, idiopathic scoliosis is, is, is seemed to be a multi-factorial problem, meaning there's many, many different things that can happen to somebody and can cause scoliosis. And this causation uh, factor leads to a curve in the spine that normally will progress during growth or in late stage of life because of gravity compressing the spine. But in either cases, we can't tell you what actually caused the curve to begin with. There are cases that actually have known causes. Neuromuscular scoliosis, this is when a patient actually has a larger neuromuscular condition, like Ehlers Downer syndrome, neurofibromatosis, cerebral palsy, and normally it's a connective tissue disorder that causes either contractures or laxity of the, of the tissues of the body, which can lead to scoliosis, or it can be something neurological within the spinal cord itself that can affect either the brain, the spinal cord, or, or different brain stem area, and that can lead to a scoliosis developing. Congenital scoliosis is a third type. This actually develops in utero and it's actually a result of bone malformation that can occur during development and it affects the spine itself. And this is where one of the bones, instead of being a rectangle, is now um, called a, it's actually a triangle or an abnormal shape and we call that a hemivertebra. These hemivertebras can be singular, they can be multi, they can be kind of hemivertebras kind of fused or malformed in that way and that will lead to a curvature because the bones are not in regular shape. And this irregular, this irregular shape causes something called congenital scoliosis. And then the last type I want to talk about is something called degenerative scoliosis. And this is caused by age-related deterioration of the spine. Now, many people will say, or some people will say that this is natural. This is a natural aging process. And I would disagree because if that was the case, that means every single person that was that was uh, has aged would have scoliosis. Normally what happens in this is something happens to their spine very early in their adult life and it remains uncorrected. And this little misalignment will slowly cause the spine to deteriorate faster in that one area versus the rest of their spine. And this accelerated degeneration in that one area can cause degenerative scoliosis. Normally, it's diagnosed around 50 years of age is when they find it. And typically, it tends to be found because they're either having some kind of problems or they get an x-ray for another reason. So out of those types of scoliosis, which are the main two that affect adults? Well, first of all, it's adult idiopathic scoliosis. Adult idiopathic scoliosis is pretty much an extension of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis that were either undiagnosed and didn't know they had it and now are now diagnosed in the adult stage because they never actually found it. I mean, the curve never became big enough. They never either were either tested or examined or, you know, and it's progressing now in the adult stage and now we're starting to, and that's when they actually find it. Or it could be also patients that actually had adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and then just left it and, they, and now they're dealing with it in the adult stage. So literally every adolescent case eventually becomes an adult case and that becomes adult idiopathic scoliosis. And by the way, 90% of adolescents are diagnosed as idiopathic scoliosis. It's by far the largest category of diagnosis. The second most common type is degenerative scoliosis. And degenerative scoliosis is where this, like I said, is where something happens early on in life and it deteriorates, the spine deteriorates and causes the curvature. Now, here's something interesting is that adolescent idiopathic scoliosis left untreated 
will lead to degenerative findings in the spine because that's a misalignment. The spine will deteriorate. So a lot of times degenerative scoliosis and adult idiopathic scoliosis may look similar in late stage life, meaning at 60 years of age. You may see deterioration in both areas. You may, and then one person could say, yes, I had scoliosis as a child. The other person would say no. And there's sometimes it's hard to distinguish unless there's some clear findings in a degenerative scoliosis versus an adolescent scoliosis. But in later stage life, sometimes it can be hard to, to distinguish the two between them because they kind of can both have degenerative findings at the same time. So the main symptoms of adult scoliosis is simply pain. What normally brings on treatment of scoliosis in the adult form is pain. Most commonly, the pain starts around 40 years of age, and it normally it happens because the spine is compressing over time, and it tends to cause localized back pain. It can lead to radiating pain, most commonly felt in the legs and feet. It can be postural changes. We tend to see more leaning to one side, uneven shoulders, uneven rib arch, arches, uneven hips. It can also affect hips, knees, and feet. If you think about it, if the spine's out of alignment, just like if a car's out of alignment, it, the first things it's gonna start to wear abnormally are gonna be the lower extremities. They start causing hip problems, knee problems, feet problems, and you think that you have some problems there, but truly it's because the alignment above is causing asymmetrical wear. And because of this, it can affect balance and it can affect gait. So left untreated, scoliosis can lead to lots of different things because it's affecting the entire biomechanical system of the body. And since everything attaches to the spine, it can not only affect other issues mechanically, but remember all your nerves go through your spine as well. So it can start to affect nerve function. And when you start to affect nerve function, it can lead to a whole host of problems like neurological pain, neurological dysfunctions, whatever those nerves are controlling cannot function to its full capacity. And it can lead to another a whole host of issues. So scoliosis, even though it's a structural component of the spine, can be very multifactorial and can start affecting many, many things left uncorrected and unchecked over somebody's entire life. So the goals of treatment in the adult patient should be one thing, it should be curve reduction. And I, strong, I, I, I believe strongly on this, that we should be reducing adult curves. However, most of the time, most patients are told not to worry about it. Just say, just when it gets bad enough and it becomes severe enough and it, you become unmanageable or you're in so much pain, we would be considering spinal surgery. Well, why wouldn't you want to reduce curves ahead of time to make sure that you never have to face those types of, of severe invasive treatment? But most importantly, you can preserve function during this whole time and you can not have to deal with the consequences of not maintaining a spine. Uh, however, most adolescents, even today, that they move into the adult stage, they're normally told by their pediatrician or their pediatric surgeon at the time, don't worry about it. Even though it's very clear that we know adults progress in the adult stage over time. So it should be curve reduction. Secondary, minimally, we should be trying to stabilize the spine, at least not letting it worse, at least hold it the same, improve spinal muscles for optimal support, and of course, reducing pain. Now, most patients don't do that. So most adult patients, when they start having pain, result, and they, they may or may not know as a result of their scoliosis, typically they start off with just trying to reduce their pain. They just say, okay, I'm trying to make my pain better, and they get pain medications or injections, and they're making their pain feel better, but their curve is still worsening, and it's still getting worse, and it's still getting bigger, and whatever's causing their pain is, get, is getting larger, so all they're doing is kind of like kicking the can down the road for a bigger problem later on. So they're not really doing what I believe what they should start doing is reducing their curve from day one, because if they start off with a smaller curve, they're gonna get a better improvement than if they let their curve get larger and then trying to reduce it later on. However, most traditional approaches are just trying to help people with their pain, not really addressing the cause. So some common treatments for adult scoliosis, most of these adult patients, when they start having pain, they go to try a whole host of things. They try chiropractic care. They go get some office therapy or physical therapy. They try home exercises. They hire physical trainers. They may go to an orthopedic surgeon and get injections. They may sometimes get bracing. They, they try all these different things and, and, and it may or may not be very effective because nothing is combining all these treatments 
into a corrective approach. And where most of these things failed is that most of these patients, they go in with back pain and they're treated like they hurt their back. They treat it like they had an injury. And what I mean by that is they go in there and they get something called low dose, long duration treatment. And low dose, long duration treatment is the way you rehabilitate an injury, like a car accident, a slip or fall, something along those lines. And they get a little bit of care over a very, very, very long time. And this little bit of care over a very long time helps them with their pain, but it doesn't reduce their curve. And their curve, unfortunately, can still progress. So what we do very differently in Scoliosis Reduction Center is that, first of all, we say it's, number one, never too late to get treatment. But two, is that we intensely invert that prescription. We do high-dose, short-duration care to get a very rapid reduction in the scoliosis. Then we use home therapy, home exercises, and home rehab and corrective bracing to help stabilize that spine after we've reduced it. So we want to reduce it and then hold that reduction to maintain spinal health and function, not only currently, but really in the future, reduce your pain and improve your quality of life so your curve doesn't have to continue to progress in the adult stage where now you're facing very invasive treatments like spinal fusion and surgery. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.